Your Excellency, the Executive Governor of Ogun State, Prince Dr. Dabo Abiodun, MFR, ably represented, the Executive Governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babajide Olushola Songolu, the Chancellor Mountaintop University, Dr. Daniel Kolawale Olukoya, the Vice Chancellor Mountaintop University, Professor Elijah Ayolabi. May I stand on existing protocol? The convocation lecture for this maiden convocation ceremony of the Mountaintop University will be delivered today by the Executive Governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babajide Olushola Songwo Olu, on the topic, the future of job and the world of work, the need for graduates that are competitive. May I respectfully invite Mr. Governor, the Executive Governor of Lagos State, to kindly step up to the desk for his citation to be read. Thank you. Mr. Babajide Songwolu was born in Lagos State on the 25th of June, 1965. He started his early education at the Government Demonstration School, Surulele, Lagos, and he continued at the JB Fe Grammar School, Ogun State. He attended the University of Lagos, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in surveying and geoinformatics and a master's degree in business administration. Mr. Sonwolu is an alumnus of the prestigious Harvard Kennedy School of Government, London Business School, and the Lagos Business School. He's also a member of the Nigerian Institute of Directors, Chartered Institute of Personnel Management, and fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Training and Development. Mr. Babajide Olushola has had an eventful and colorful career in the public service. In 2003, he was appointed as special advisor to the deputy governor on corporate matters, and later as special advisor to the executive governor on corporate matters, also in 2004. From 2004 to 2005, at the age of 39, he was appointed Acting Commissioner for Economic Planning and Budget. He later became the Substantive Commissioner for Commerce and Industry in 2007, following his exceptional performance. His managerial imprint and administrative sagacity became notable when he was appointed a Commissioner in the Lagos State Ministry of Establishment, Training and Pensions in 2007. During this period, Mr. Songwa Olu authored an executive civil service framework designed around the Human Capital Performance Index, which puts Lagos State civil servants among the highest and regularly paid in the country. He was also instrumental to the setting up of the Lagos State Pensions Commission, LASPEC, a contributory pension scheme even ahead of the federal government of Nigeria. In 2016, he was appointed the chief executive of the Lagos State Development and Property Commission, LASPEC. And in just two years, the visionary administrator returned the hitherto struggling organization to a path of efficiency and profitability. Some of his other notable contributions to Lagos State Civil Service include the following. I'll mention just three. One, setting up and serving as the pioneer chairman of Lagos State Security Trust Fund. Two, preparation and publication of Lagos State Empowerment and Development Strategy, LACIT. And four, three rather, establishing the Lagbos Asset Management Limited to ease the transportation woes of Lagosians, thereby complementing the bus rapid transit BRT system in Lagos State. <laughs> Mr. Somolu's enterprising career in the private sector, his defining roles in public service, and selfless contributions to the society have attracted recognitions and accolades, 
both at home and abroad. But as a man attired in modesty, these awards and laurels are encouragements that keep him on the path of service to God and humanity. Now to the big one. On March 9, 2019, a gubernatorial election was held in Lagos State, and Mr. Babajide Olushola Songolu contested on the platform of the All Progressive Party, All Progressive Congress, APC. He pulled 75.6% of the total valid votes cast, <laughs> defeating other 44 contestants who represented different political parties to emerge winner at the elections. In fact, a whooping 72.12% vote difference between him and his closest rival affirmed his overwhelming preference by negotiations. Following his resounding victory and convincing victory at the polls, the Independent Electoral Commission announced him the winner on March 10, 2019, making him the 15th governor of Lagos State. Mr. Governor is a devout Christian, a family man. He's married to Dr. Ibijoke Songwolu, and they are blessed with lovely children. In addition to his love for public service, he's a member of numerous prestigious clubs, which includes Ikoi Club 1938, the Island Club, and the Yoruba Tennis Club. His valuable experience garnered from executive level roles in the public and private sector has distinguished him and made him a resourceful and notable contributor to the development of this nation. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I hereby present to you the humble achiever and astute administrator, a philanthropist by excellence, the God-fearing governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babajide Olushola Songwo Olu. Thank you. Governor of Ogun State, the Governor of Ogun State, Prince Dakpo Abiodu, ably represented by the Secretary to the Government, Mr. Tokumbo Talabi, the Vice Chancellor of the Mountain Top University, our Father in the Lord, my Daddy. Dr. Daniel Kolawale Olukoya and his amiable wife, Dr. Mrs. Shade Olukoya. Please clap for them very well. Thank you. The Chairman, Board of Trustees, Professor Akitude Obilade, and other members of the board, the Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Elijah. Adebo Ali Ayolabi. The Senate members of the university, vice chancellors of other universities here present, especially the vice chancellor of my own university. Well, you know, as a governor now, so it's the University of 
Board University of Lagos and Lagos State University. So both of them are adopted. Professor Ogudipe and Professor Fagbon. Thank you very much for gracing this event with us. Our royal fathers in the house, traditional title holders, our assistant general overseers, our senior general overseers, so I'm partial, I would say my own senior regional overseer, Dr. Pastor Moses Adeboale, I'm sure you'll pardon me, is a man that I respect and I appreciate so much. Graduates and family members here present. Graduates of Mountain Top University. Graduates of the Mountain Top University. Graduate of the Mountain Top University. Thank you very much. Our family members, our fathers, and the Lord, spiritual and temporal, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I stand here very humble, very, very humble, but giving grace to the Almighty God, as I have a unique opportunity to be the first guest lecturer at the first, very first convocation ceremony of the Mountain Top University. I give glory to the Almighty God, the I am that I am, the one that is bigger than his biggest, the one that has kept each and every one of us here today. We give glory that God Almighty has made December 20 a reality for each and every one of you. But I want to stand here and thank my Father in the Lord, Dr. D.K. Olukoya, who single-handedly chose and asked me that he will be honored if I take this. And I truly want to thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Um, but more importantly is also to thank the Vice Chancellor, who found me also worthy to be standing here very humble to deliver this first convocation lecture. Thank you very much, sir. I've been asked to talk on something that is very germane, but very critical to all of you graduates here today. And the topic is the future of jobs and the world of work. The need for graduates that are globally competitive. The need for graduates that are globally competitive. Let me start by first expressing the delight that I stand, like I said, that I'm the first person to be delivering the convocation lecture at this first convocation ceremony. My gratitude goes to the proprietor who deemed me worthy, like I said, and I'm immensely grateful. Today is an auspicious occasion in the life of hundreds of graduating students of this university. A journey that commenced a few years ago has now come to an end, and there's a great cause for celebration. I congratulate all of you, all of you that are graduating today, having sailed several hurdles, lectures, tests, assignments, late nights, and some cases, sleepless nights in the course of these last few years. I rejoice with you and your parents and guardians on this laudable feat of achievement. I welcome you all into this new phase of maturity and responsibility, in which, the light, in which society will begin to place unprecedented demands on you. You have reached a turning point in your life, and some children that you had come to expect and enjoy will dissipate in the months and years ahead of you. Let me also seize this opportunity to appreciate the untiring effort of your lecturers, your teachers, and your administrator, and as well as the management of this great university. Together, they have created an enabling environment and atmosphere that has allowed learning and skilling to occur and to afford you the opportunity of backing the degrees you are getting with sound knowledge and expertise. I think your lecturers, they deserve a round of applause. They do. The sacrifices they have made to prepare you for this next phase of life are part of the reasons why you now owe it to the world to translate those learning into values that will make the world better than you've met it today. 
They say change is here for good. A little over 30 years ago, just about 32 years ago to be precise, I was in your shoes preparing to set forth into the world of work. I completed my undergraduate degree in the Faculty of Engineering, University of Lagos, with a surveying and geomatics in 1988. And like many of you today, I was not exactly certain of what awaited me. But I must acknowledge these were very different times. It would be difficult for many of you to acknowledge that there was once a time where mobile phones and the internet did not exist. You cannot imagine that when we were in university, we didn't know anything called Google, so we couldn't check anything. We couldn't research anything. You have to go to the library with piles and piles of books for you to even check a single topic. But such is the world that we were, that we graduated. I recently came across an article that listed jobs that didn't exist just 10 years or 15 years ago, not to talk of 30 years ago. Some of those jobs that include the following, I hear people have jobs like social media managers, application developers, podcast producer, telemedicine physicians, driveless car engineer, cloud computing specialist, data scientist, drone operators, um, YouTube content creator. These are all strange things to us 30, 35 years ago. Times are changing, and the changing are done very, very fast. Every one of you in this room today is in possession of a mobile phone. Am I right? Every single one of you have a mobile phone. 30, 35 years ago, it was a luxury which will record the events of today, even as I'm standing here, some of you will record it, and within the next few minutes, it's gone viral, it's gone everywhere in the world. Every second, every minute will be recorded or live streamed on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, as the case may be. Even though there will be official photographs, many of you will not need to wait for them to produce and print the frame of the photographs from today. With those forms in your hand, you will have achieved everything for prosperity. Now try to imagine this graduation ceremony happening 32 years ago. No phone, no internet, no social media. Only a few people will have access to personal cameras. Most of you will have to depend on the official photographer and the pictures not printed until several days after. In 1988, there were nothing like emails. The commonest technology at that time were telex and fax machine. I'm sure many of you are struggling to imagine what the world would look like then. A lot has changed, and indeed a lot is still changing. Let me ask, how many among you that are graduating here today have ever seen a telex message before or a fax machine? Jobs that used to exist were telex operators, fax operators, switchboard operators. What happened to them? These were all roles that provided employment for a large number of people at that time. There used to be a job known as lean type operator, a person who operated a typesetting machine. That job was rendered obsolete by the emergence of photo typesetting technology about a decade ago. Once upon a time, Lifts and elevators were complicated machines that required dedicated operators. Today, virtually everyone, virtually every lift will encounter is an automatic one. This is the nature of work. New technology comes along and renders old ways of doing things obsolete. New companies come along and disrupt the business model. Their new platforms and their disruptive models. Today, around the world, many people earn a living from driving cars for Uber and similar companies, known as ride hailing companies. People also earn a living from renting their homes and their rooms on Airburn. These businesses and work models, captured by the term gig economy, did not exist 15 or 20 years ago. When you look at the list of America's largest companies by market capitalization just about 10, 12 years ago, 
you will see the top names like ExxonMobil, you see General Electric, you see Microsoft, AT&T, Procter & Gamble, Berkshire, you see Google, you see Chevron, you see Johnson & Johnson, and you see Walmart. But if you fast track to 2018 and 2019, just a decade, it's even difficult for you to see ExxonMobil on the first 10 list that was there 10 years ago. All that has dropped. And the first top five companies you see on the global list now today are Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook. In fact, in, in 2008, none of these names were in that rank. There was, no, there was no Amazon, there was no Facebook, there was nothing like that 10 years ago. If the past was led and defined by companies dealing in oil and gas, brick and mortar retail, computer hardware and automobile, the future clearly belongs to data and software. Data, as they say, is the new oil. Intangibles are superseding tangibles as the predominant currency of the emerging era. In another 10 years, I can assure you that the top 10 companies that I've just shared will have changed significantly again. And it's even possible that there will be companies on that list that is not yet founded as we speak today. So what are the changing expectations and the behaviors? In 2010, PricewaterhouseCoopers, a consulting firm, commissioned a survey on the millennials across 75 countries and published an interesting report titled Millennials at Work, Reshaping the Workplace. The report defined millennials as people born between 1980 and 2000. The subject at this survey were all described as age 31 or under that has graduated between 2008 and 2011. In other words, they were all very recent graduates at the time in the same shoes as the young people in the auditorium here today. That report outlined the following key findings about the nature and psychology of young people survey as follows. They have minimal loyalty to employers. Work-life balance more important than financial reward. They expect to move quickly up in their career ladder. They are comfortable with technology and often preferring electronic communication over face-to-face -face communication. Commonly expressed feeling about being frustrated by the ways we, the older generation, are behaving. I can't imagine they're calling me an older generation. <laughs> if all the above sound familiar, you should not be surprised. Generation Z, born between 1990 and 2015, and to which I imagine some of you belong, have understandably taken these millennials' characteristics to new levels. You are seen as even more pragmatic than the millennials. The point I'm making is that you all, the young people in this room, are very much unlike your parents. 30, 40, 50 years, what many people wanted the most was just to be a graduate, to find a nice and comfortable job with a good salary, good prospect of promotion, and very importantly, a decent pension scheme. It was not out of place to expect to spend one's entire working life in a single organization, growing on the job and getting promoted quietly. Today, you speak to many young people and it is clear that they have, that things have really changed. No one wants to give their entire life to any single organization. Now, I'm not saying that that is a bad thing, I'm only trying to point out how things have changed. Young people nowadays are very comfortable with changing jobs quickly and often, moving from one organization to another and often across the different roles. In fact, having realized the changing nature of the workplace, young people willingly acquire requisite skills and are interested in working freelance. Some of them want to work from the house for two or more companies at the same time. You know, so they call one hustle. They call that one just spreading themselves. Autonomy and independence are prized quality. And the companies that offer even increasing level of flexibility tend to enjoy access to the best talent. Let me say that with all the uncertainty that characterizes the world of work today and in the future, don't feel bad if you don't know what exactly 
you want to do straight out of university. As a young person, it is important to keep an open mind and to be willing to explore various career options and potentials. So don't be rigid, don't be fixated on anything, open and free yourself. A good number of you will end up working and making a mark in fields quite different from what you have studied. This is not a new phenomenon. By the way, I'm a good example. Of course, they read my resume, I trained as a surveyor, so I'm a surveyor with geoinformatics and all of that, but I did survey for only two, three years. And thereafter, I've moved on to other things. I've worked briefly in the field, which was doing my seismic survey acquisition before branching into banking. And I'd worked as a banker for over, over 10 years and then seized the opportunity across other sectors, right? And ultimately, I stand here today humbly as a politician. In fact, today is 205 days that I've been sworn in as the governor of the state, meaning that i would spend about 14% of my time in my 1,460 days that I have as a governor. So I'm thanking and I'm thinking and I'm counting. That's the way we should do it. But before joining banking, I tried my hands at entrepreneurship. Just like many of you are, are going to be doing, I imagine, at some point in your future, I started a business called Dal a Plumber to fill a gap that I identified in the market at that time. So I wanted easy access for people to have plumbers, to have electricians, to have tilers, you know, in the marketplace at that time, you know, but my plan to connect people that need all of these services, it didn't work. And why did it not work? You know, so you can imagine 30 years ago, somebody setting up a business and the business is predicated on working telephone lines. 30 years ago, there were not very many adequate telephone lines. And so the business model, you know, didn't work well because each time we're waiting for the phone to ring and for people to call for either plumbers or electricians or carpenters or tilers, the phone never worked because we didn't have GSM then. They were all deadlines and I'm sure GA knows. Geo knows that that time we have to keep going to Nitel to keep preparing the phone, keep preparing the phone. Instead of being Dal a plumber, we end up just being Dal Nitel. So it did not work. So eventually I had to shut down the business, but I learned very important lesson about life and business through that venture. I want you to know that no experience is ever wasted. We gain wisdom even from our failed ventures. So never be afraid. You know, if you fail once, don't give up. Get up again. If you fail the other time, don't give up. Get up again. Each time you come down, keep getting up because your best time is still ahead of you. As young people, the world is your oyster. Keep your options open and don't see university as the end of learning. It is far from the end. In fact, it is merely the beginning, the start of a journey of learning and of adapting the unending change. So much has changed in the last two to three decades. Now imagine the next 20, 30 years. We have barely scratched the surface in the, in the change that technology and innovation are unleashing on us. Much more is still going to change in the years ahead. One interesting game we can play is to try and imagine what jobs will exist by year 2050. That, that do not exist today, and what jobs exist today that will no longer exist by year 2050. So what are the shapers and enablers of this new landscape? Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I will sketch out the main feature of the landscape of the new and emerging world of work. Let me now focus on some of the more important factors and trends that are shaping the world today. Four of those things will come to mind readily, and they, will, they are interconnected and interdependent in keeping with the patterns of life that we live in now. First is demography. The second is rising youth unemployment and growing youth discontent. Third is globalization. Fourth is technology, embedded by the concept of the, third, the fourth industrial revolution. Under demographics, let's start with demography. In sub-Saharan Africa, the context of our demography is by all accounts exceptional, unlike in the West and in other parts of Asia, where aging population have practically become the norm. In sub-Saharan Africa, is faced with primarily a youthful population, by far 
the youngest population in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, 60% of Africans' population is below the age of 25. In Nigeria, half of our population today are below 20, and 75 of our population is under 35. Here in Lagos, the young people of below 25 constitute well over 50% of the entire population. These are remarkable and thought-provoking statistics, whether this large youth population turns out to be a blessing or a burden will be decided by the decision that we make as a nation. The youth unemployment and the discontent. Closely linked to the demographic context is our ability or our inability to provide jobs for our teeming population of young people. Between four to five million young Nigerians enter the labor market annually. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, over the last five years, 19 million Nigerians enter the labor force but as a country, we can only absorb less than 4 million. The World Bank has recently estimated that to keep the employment rate constant, Nigeria needs to create about 30 million jobs by year 2030. Year 2030 is just 10 years away. Youth unemployment around the world is closely linked to the manifestation of youth discontent. The Harab Spring, which I'm sure you all remember, in 2010-2011, was triggered by a young Tunisian treat vendor who set himself ablaze to protest harassment by city officials. It has been argued that there is a connection between South Africa's rate of unemployment and the spate of xenophobic attack that has plagued in recent years. With the power of social media and the internet, it has become more, much easier for young people to aggregate and amplify their grievances and to organize themselves to vent their frustration on the system they hold responsible for undermining their dreams. The message is clear. Government has a lot to do to make young people feel valued and to create the environment for them to thrive and prosper. Here in Lagos, well, okay, so here in Ogun State. <laughs> <laughs> but no way we are the same. <laughs> we, have a, we have a strongly minded responsibility, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, Lagos was one of the only four Nigerian states in the year 2018 that created jobs at a rate faster than the growth of the labor force. In other words, we were able to actually create enough jobs to reduce the unemployment rate. I must reiterate that Lagos State truly appreciates the inherent penalties, potentials of our young people and the state. In December 2015, a collaboration between Lagos State Bureau of Statistics and UNIPA produced an international publication with the theme, Demographic Dividend in Lagos State, the opportunity we must forego. Indeed, young people resident in Lagos today constitute a rare window of opportunity that we cannot afford to squander. I am pleased to let you know that earlier this month, just about three weeks ago, we launched our Technology Innovation Fund, which is for science and research to support the young people in the state. And I want to say to you that the chairman of that fund is actually the vice chancellor of University of Lagos. We're putting a seed fund of about 250 million there. It's just to ensure and to enhance technology dividend and um, technology and innovation and anything around science, just for young people to be able to create, to think, right? And I've said to them that the entry barrier must be very low so that people can access that fund and just think and just, you know, do crazy, innovative things with science and technology, and the chairman is here. Thank you. On globalization, this is a word that has come to stay with us and to shape the way we interpret the world we live in. In its simplest terms, it refers to growing breakdown of national barriers or national borders. The rules that once governed a world composed of distinct nation state are being rewritten under the impact of technology especially modern communication and transportation technology the world has taken on the characteristics of a global village with implication for the present and the future of work today workers compete for jobs across geography and workforce mobility is arguably at its highest it is easier than ever before for young people to find jobs opportunity outside of their immediate environment. And as young Nigerians, 
in the job market of the 21st century, your competition is not only fellow young Nigerians living in Nigeria, but young people from anywhere around the world. And I'm sure you all appreciate that. Any of your cousins, your relatives that are anywhere in the world can compete for the same job that you that are here are also competing for. So that is the whole essence of globalization, right? You need to act local, but you need to think global. That's what it is. The fourth industrial revolution. When you hear the term fourth industrial revolution, the question that immediately comes to mind is, what are the first three revolutions? The first industrial revolution kicked off in the later part of the 18th century, when mankind discovered the potential in heating water to generate steam. That steam proved very useful in powering everything from trains to textile factories at that time. The second industrial revolution began in the 19th century and followed the discovery of innovative ways of harnessing electric current of power building and machines. The revolution transformed the transformation, the transportation and communication industry, giving us the petrol combustion engine, the aircraft, and the telephone. The third industrial revolution, also known as the digital revolution, imagined in the mid 20th century around the concept of computing. Now the fourth industrial revolution belongs to the 21st century, which all of you have. According to the World Economic Forum, it is characterized by a fusion of technologies that are blurring the lines between the physical, the digital, and the biological spheres. The spread of current breakthrough has now has no historic precedent when compared with the previous industrial revolution. The fourth is evolving at an exponential rate that's a linear, than a linear pace. Moreover, it is disrupting amongst every industry in every country. This unprecedented revolution is manifestation in a variety of forms, with the names which I'm sure you all know, things around artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, robotic, internet of things, 3D printing, nanotechnology, quantum computing, and so on. The fourth industrial revolution presents great opportunity as well as a great risk. It could herald an age of unprecedented global efficiency, prosperity, and comfort, or it could simply and sharply widen the divide between the rich and the poor, between the skilled and the unskilled. It is up to all of us to choose by our action and inaction what the outcomes we would like to see. So what are the roles and responsibility of we stakeholders? So with the above in mind, what should we as government, and I stand here humbly as one, what should be our role as academicians, university administrators, be doing to ensure that we feel we fully reap the potential dividend of demographic, demographic opportunity? How can we align our policies, our practices, our vision with our fast-changing reality of the workplace of today and tomorrow for the good of our young people. First, we must embrace and leverage technology. We must invest in democratizing access to speed, high-speed internet and cutting-edge technology for all our young people around the country. This is the thinking behind what we call in Lagos our smart city vision, which is one of our key pillars that is driving our government. We must also extend this to our curriculum transformation. We must not progress into the 21st century using 20th century curriculum. Our young people must become comfortable with coding, with robotics, with 3D printing, and other technology from an early age, especially in the public school system, regardless of what academic tracks our students are on, art, science, or social sciences, technological illiteracy must be a common denominator. Secondly, we must equip students with a 21st century mindset, which means helping them to acquire skills in digital marketing, analytical reasoning, design thinking, project management, cyber security and online protection, <coughs> and more importantly, entrepreneurship. Let me speak more about some of these things. Digital marketing. With the rise of e-commerce and online influencing, opportunities are bound for deployment of skills such as social media management, copywriting and content creator, 
search engine optimization, tracking and analyzing metrics, and so on. <coughs> Analytical reasoning, jobs of the future will, pref will preferentially accommodate employers who are analytically sound, who can make sense of copious and desperate streams of data. They will be able to review available information, discern patterns and trends, and make impactful action. Design thinking. This refers to being able to discern what customers want or what they need, and being able to design solutions around tailor-made solutions to fill the gap. A, design, a skill in design thinking it will create enormous job opportunity for young graduates because organizations are interested in employers that will help, that will help them to learn and better understand the users of their products and services through testing. A graduate with design thinking skills will be employable in future because he or she will add value to the organization by helping the organization to create better products, services, and better internal processes. Entrepreneurship. Employees of the future are expected to be solution providers. In preparing our graduates for a changing world of work, they need to be open-minded, they need to be creative, they need to be risk takers, and bold in taking actionable decision. In other words, you must install in our students the habit of thinking entrepreneurially. We must expose them to the world of entrepreneurship early during their course of study, enrich their entrepreneurial journey by encouraging them to develop their ideas into startups and provide them with necessary institutional support and backing. As a government, it is our responsibility to create the enabling environment for our entrepreneurs to start, to, to try. In Lagos State, we are already fully aware of this and we are committed to, to the transformational business environment reform. You may recall that in October 2019, the World Bank announced that Nigeria has moved 15 places to the Ease of Doing Business Index. I'm pleased to announce to this audience that the World Bank acknowledged Lagos State as having contributed significantly to that outcome. We will continue to support entrepreneurship aspiration of our young people. I'm sure some of you know that we have what we call the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund. What that fund is about is to identify ready, set to go jobs that are startups and they can help you. They can help you scale up you know, your ideas, you know, mentor you, coach you, and also be able to give you seed capital for you to start some of your great ideas that you have with you. I thought you we were going to start for Lagos State Employment Trust Fund. Thank you. <laughs> Thirdly, we must do more to evolve and include young people in policy making and governance and encourage them to take it seriously. More is this, more on this I will talk about. Having highlighted some of the responsibility of important stakeholders in creating and nurturing this environment that supports young people to thrive in the emerging world of work. Let me now focus on some of your responsibility as young people. Indeed, you also, should, you also shoulder important responsibility which you must do to discharge to the fullest. So what are your roles and responsibility as young graduates today? Especially the graduating class here today, you have obligation and responsibility as well. I'm here to remind you of those obligations and to challenge you to rise up to, the, to discharge them. First, you must commit yourself to lifelong learning. You will be judged not only by what you know, but also how quickly you can learn new things and unlearn old ones. It is not enough to try and stay current. You must strive to be ahead of the game. We have already established the fact that jobs of the future will be driven by technology. And students who are technologically inclined and prepared will have an edge over those who are not. As things stand today, people who cannot use a computer will struggle to survive in a typical workplace. A few decades down the line, the bar will have risen. And it is very impossible that people who cannot code or program will deem fit in the workplace. You can imagine today if you cannot send an, easy, an ordinary email. I mean, it, it cannot be imagined. So, I mean, each and every one of you knows that that's the minimum that we can do. You must get used 
to change and to disruption. Many of the things you learn in university will have grown obsolete even before you complete your NYC. That's the truth. 50 or 100 years down the line, we don't know what new technologies will have emerged to disrupt the world as we know it now. But it is certain that to thrive in that world, university graduates will need to be fully prepared. They will need to be educated in the tools and the language of that world and will need to be able to compete with multitude of other graduates in the quest for jobs and employment. You must learn to change assumptions. So you must learn to challenge assumptions. The greatest business and entrepreneurial ideas of this age will be found in the ability to change conventional thinking. Your ability to ask the right questions and to interrogate existing assumptions will set you apart in an increasingly competitive world. You must make yourself interested in policy making and governance. I'll repeat, you must make yourself interested in policy making and governance. I know that it is often assumed that it is cool to be cynical and dismissive of government and its institution, but you must never succumb to that temptation. Nigeria belongs to you as well as to many, anyone else, and government at all levels, be it at federal, at state and local, have a great deal of power and influence to shape how the country will turn, how the country will turn out for young generation and for future generations. As one of my leaders in the political sphere, Ashraj Bola Ahmed, will always say, power is never served a la carte. Nobody will serve you the capacity to exercise power and influence on the plateau of gold. No, nobody will. As young people, you need to start getting more and more interested and involved in governance. I'm not saying you need to join a political party right now or become a politician like myself, no. What I'm saying is that you must become active citizens, pay attention to the workings of government and the politics. You must become interested in the people governing you and you must come together as a pressure group to ensure that you contribute to designing the future. Just about two weeks ago, I also delivered a lecture to the alumni of the Faculty of Engineering University of Lagos, where they were asking me as a politician that should everybody go into politics. And I did explain to them that even from the very first step in life, you have been, a, you have, you have been playing politics in one way or the other. In the university, there is politics. In the boardroom, in companies, there is politics. In at home, even between daddy and mommy, there is a bit of politics. So all of us, are, it's just that the politician is like a professor that is different for government, but every one of us play it in one way or the other. So we needed to explain that, right? And the fact that you are once the president of your student union or you are once the president of your faculty, you know that you had to convince your fellow students to vote for you or to ensure that you are the leader of the class. That in itself is politics. You know, for you to have gotten them to elect you as a tier leader, or as a, that is politics. So you must get involved in one way or the other. And I wish to also announce to you that young people are relevant in government. Our government as one of the few governments today that have, I have over five people that are under 40 in my cabinet. So for the very first time, we'll have younger people that we're bringing. I have a 32, I have a 34, I have a 37 year old people that are running the government of Lagos State. So you should never stay aloof and believe that it's not for you. As I end this lecture, I would like to urge all stakeholders to put all hands on deck to prepare for the intensifying paradigm shift that is already upon us. We do not have a choice. The world is changing and will continue to change regardless of whether we understand it or align with it. We have unleashed forces of technological disruption that can no longer be slowed down or be stopped. As government, we are doing our best to appreciate the scale of this transformation and to adapt our thinking and processes to take the challenge of it. And it will not be easy journey, but it is doable. The university management and academic community must make the same effort to a large extent it falls on you to prepare these students for the future. Whether they enter the world of work with timidity or confidence will largely depend on you. Indeed, 
the tax of preparing emerging young workforce for the future of jobs is something that people and nations around the world are taking very seriously. As a society that fails to prepare its youth for the future, is a, a society that fails to prepare its youth for the future is a society that is preparing to fail in a big way. And I'm sure our society will not be that society. MTU will not be that society. We must join hands to work together, the ivory tower and the corridors of power, to create an environment that will unleash the potential of our young people. Go forth and conquer the world. Go forth and conquer the world. The world is waiting for you. And to you, the graduating class, let me once again congratulate you on all these momentous, on your momentous occasion that your life and your career is starting today. Congratulations also to your parents, to your guardians, and to your sponsors who sacrifice to ensure you get a high quality education are today being rewarded. It is my prayer that you continue to bring joy, you bring satisfaction, fulfillment to your family, to your loved ones, today and in the future. No one can promise you that the journey ahead will be, as, will be an easy one. There will be plenty of learning, unlearning and relearning to do. There will be there will be mistakes and there will be setbacks. There will also be obstacles to surmount and lessons to learn. One of the most tools that you will require as you proceed will be the spirit of endurance and perseverance. You will need to endure, you will need to persevere. Let me leave you with the words of a very wise man, the educationist, the famous late Tai Sholarin which he did about 50 years ago, as a quote. I found by hard experience that all that is noble and laudable was to be achieved only through difficulties and trials and tears and danger. Life, if it is going to be abundant, must have plenty of hills and vales. It must have plenty of sunshine and rough weather. It must be rich in of, of Obfusion and perspicacity. It must be packaged with days of danger and of apprehension. Unquote. Endeavor to keep these words in your mind as you set forth from this great citadel, from this great institution that will know will be created leaders of tomorrow. You are armed. You are armed with two weapons. You are armed academically, you are also armed spiritually. No one has the opportunity that you have. A lot of people out there are armed academically and they are using their own wisdom. But you are armed spiritually because you have also gone through an, a citadel that has prepared you for your spiritual journey, for your academic journey, for the future. And I want to admonish and say to you that the future is great for you. The future is bright. It's really remaining for you to take up the opportunity. I want you to go forth and conquer the world. Long live Mountain Top University. Long live Ogun State and Lagos State. Long live the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you very much.